Arctic explorers Malaika Vaz and Jahawi Bertoli. Good afternoon. We're so excited to be here today. My name is Malaika and I'm a wildlife presenter and filmmaker. And in the last few years, my work has focused on lesser known critters for television, big cats as part of my Nat Geo Early Career Grant. But today, I am so excited to be talking about our shared passion for the oceans. Yeah. My name is Jahawi Batoli. I'm an underwater filmmaker, but also wildlife photographer. Um, grew up in Kenya, spent a lot of time out in the Mara with big cats, but my real passion is the ocean, and that's what I've been focusing my time on. Now, Malaika, when it comes to marine stories, what is your focus and why? I've always chosen to focus on marine trafficking in the last few years, and it's because when I was spending time out at sea on these fishing vessels looking for marine megafauna, I realized that we were treating the oceans as though they were inexhaustible. And when you think of the word wildlife trafficking, you associate it with ivory and with elephants and tigers, but people don't often think about the marine stuff that gets out of our oceans. So for the last few years, I've been making stories that are focused on marine trafficking in India's oceans. But coming back to you, Jahawi, I'd love to understand more about why you do what you do and how it all started. Well, I was blessed to sort of grow up in such a diverse and beautiful country as Kenya. And we spent time on this little wild bit of the coast. And you know, as a child, it was the funnest thing. Get up early in the morning, run to the beach, and go snorkeling and see what was going on. Or at low tide, check out all the little rock pools. <laughs> And it was an idyllic kind of upbringing. But as I grew older, I realized it was changing. Mm -hmm. When I went out, all the little things I used to go out and see were disappearing. And to the point now, it was almost like a, a barren wasteland. And I was like, well, there is so much emphasis on the terrestrial wildlife in Kenya, but no one is really looking at the oceans. And huge changes are happening in our oceans, but there's also huge amounts of stories to be found. Yeah. So I started looking into ocean stories and came across this incredible story about a humpback whale migration that comes through the Kenyan coast. And I was like, I have to make a film about this. Mm -hmm. So the support of National Geographic, we went outside to try and film the first sequences of humpback whales in Kenya. And as uh, all good wildlife does, they didn't show up this year. <laughs> <laughs> but in this process, it's been very exciting because we were working with communities because wildlife is one side, but there are people who have been living with these animals. And if you really want to find the stories, you need to work with these communities. Mm -hmm. So we went into these villages, especially in the Lama Archipelago, and we were interviewing old fishermen. And we were trying to find out old stories of humpback whales. And we did find some incredible stories, but actually what we found was a much bigger project mm -hmm. because we found that we could actually tell the story of the changes in the Indian Ocean from the stories of these old fishermen mm -hmm. and through their eyes. And it's so important when you go into a community and you want to create educational material, you have to understand this is their story. Yeah. And they're the best people to tell it. Mm -hmm. So we've been now working on this film. We've been interviewing fishermen. And we're now trying to tell the story of the change through the eyes of this really old, incredible fisherman. And we have a little We have a trailer. sneak peek? Yes, we have a okay. sneak peek. Awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> bahari yetu kuna wengi hawajui bahari ni nini najiona niko nyumbani nikiwa baharini nilikuwa nikiona watu wangu wa swahili wamesafiri kwa karne nyingi kupitia bahari sisi ni watu wa bahari kwa muda mrefu kadiri ninavyoweza kukumbuka Nimejua bahari yetu ni kubwa na inaonekana haina mwisho. Ilikuwa imejaa maisha sote tulikuwa tukijionea. Ilionekana bahari ilikuwa imejaa samaki. Uvuvi ulikuwa rahisi sana. Ulikuwa na uwezo wa kuvua kadiri ya kile unachotaka kuuza. Lakini katika maisha yangu 
nimeona bahari yetu inazorota na kufa kabisa na sisi ndio tunaua bahari lakini tunaweza kuwa suluhisho bado tuko na muda wa kuokoa bahari yetu ikiwa tunashikana mikono pamoja mimi ni mvuvi hakuna kitu kingine ninachoweza kufanya nitakuwa mvuvi hadi nitakapokufa kwa hivyo nifanye nini kizazi kijacho kitafanya nini kuokoa bahari yetu ni kushikana pamoja Thank you for sharing with that with us and I'm yeah. so excited to see the final documentary once it's done. Yes, coming soon. <laughs> now tell me, Malaika, was there a moment that inspired you to tell ocean stories? So I grew up in a small coastal village in a place in India called Goa and when I was younger I used to compete in windsurfing professionally so I would spend huge amounts of time training in the ocean and this one time I was all alone it was probably 5 p.m. and I saw this enormous ripple in the distance and it didn't really look like a turtle or a dolphin so I had to go closer and when I went closer I saw this humpback whale just spy hopping out of the ocean and looking me straight in the eye and in that moment i was blown away because i didn't even know that we had humpback whales in our waters and in that moment i also realized that i wanted to tell stories about the oceans as a way to understand them better not just in my backyard but across the world amazing you yeah, had better luck than i did with humpbacks <laughs> <laughs> now i'm sure everyone here would really like to know what are you working on at the moment so for the last three and a half years, along with my best friend and teammate, I've been working on a film on marine trafficking with manta rays. So we've been following the trade pipeline from India's brown murky waters, where people don't even know we have mantas, to the Indo-Myanmar border, where I've found through my investigation that there are links between wildlife trafficking and insurgency in the region. And then finally, going undercover in the wildlife markets of Guangzhou and Hong Kong in China, um, pretending to be a seafood trader to understand how much of this contraband is being sourced from India's waters. Um, the film is in its sports production stage right now, but we have a little sneak peek as well. My generation was born at the peak of the world's sixth mass extinction. Look at that! But for me, extinction is something that's happening in my own backyard. The very first time I saw a manta ray, I was diving off a coral reef in the Maldives. I hadn't seen anything like it before. And ever since then, mantas have captivated me like no other species. I'm heading to this boat where I've heard that there are large landings of rays, so let's see what we find there. And for the past few years, I've been seeing too many manta rays where they shouldn't be. Look, they have gill plates here. This is what they're after. Um, predominantly, one of the biggest threats to mantas has been these fisheries for them where people are actually targeting animals to be able to extract certain body parts like their, their gill plates out. No, no, students. I've been tracking the strait down, living with fishermen and witnessing the hunt out at sea. My investigation has taken me to places that I could have never imagined. We got our information through a source that there are some contraband items which are being transported in a vehicle. I am thousands of kilometers away from the east coast of India where these gill plates were sourced from, at the Indo-Myanmar border. And looking at these bags that represent over 40 to 50 animals, I'm only beginning to understand the numbers and the transnational scale of the street. I've been to customs warehouses in remote border towns and tracked down middlemen 
And I've gone undercover in the biggest market for wildlife products in the world, China. Can you inside? There's no need to surgery. No, there's no need to surgery. Just need to. Mark soy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you should go and chop it up. Then you can buy buy pine soy. It's like we're just getting the best of what we have. Pine soy is in the market. It's in the market. It's easy to get. Once you've reduced that population down to 50, 20, 10 percent of its of its natural levels. You're looking at decades and decades for it to recover, if, if ever. The deeper you dig, the bigger it gets. This is the heart of the illegal wildlife trade. And the supply chain points straight back home. Um, I mean, that's, that's some pretty incredible stuff. And I mean, it's... Hard to watch, but I have a question: Is being a woman in situations like that? How is how's your experience been? To be honest, initially, Jahawi, um, I received a lot of opposition for being a woman. I remember being told multiple times by seafood traders that I needed to get out of there or I would be hurt badly. But over time, I've realised that when you spend enough time at these fishing ports and going undercover in these different wildlife markets, you become part of the furniture. Um, and I've also realized that being a woman is such an asset when you're doing undercover investigative work because people see you as less threatening. So they kind of invite you into their spaces. They take you into places that some of my male colleagues wouldn't be taken into. But more importantly, they trust you with their stories. They will tell you that they can, you can come into their house and hear about how they connect with the ocean. And for me, that's the most important part of being a woman in the field. Yeah, um, I can tell you my wife gets a much better reaction than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to you, Jahawi, what are the challenges of filming in the Lamu Archipelago and across Kenya? Well, the Lamu Archipelago is an incredibly unique place, firstly because it's proximity to Somalia, and so that makes um, working in the northern bit of the archipelago quite challenging at times. So you do have security <laughs> concerns which you have to think about. We generally go up in traditional dows and tend to spend one night and head out and not spend much time there because mm -hmm. you never know what's going to happen. But the archipelago is where two big currents come through and you've got two big rivers also coming up. So we only have such a small window of time when we can get in and film in clear water. So on one side it's very special because it's like a window into an otherwise unknown environment. But you really have to make sure you're planned out and ready to go when things happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, pretty incredible. So I know your work also focuses on policy change. Now, do you think that you can actually have tangible change through film? I do. And I think that to have tangible change, you kind of have to be really, really intentional about the process of creating impact. You can't just create a provocative film and put it out into the universe and hope that you know magical unicorns will help deliver impact. You have to be conscious of it from the get-go. And when I was making my documentary, I realized that a film alone wasn't a strong enough medium to push for policy change. So along with a teammate of mine, we made a rough cut of some of the footage, and we took that to the Wildlife Trust of India, which is one of India's best research and advocacy organizations, and to WildAid, which is an anti-trafficking organization based in the US. And Last year, we actually got India's first baseline data survey on mantas across the Indian coast. So that was really exciting. And when I was filming in the field in China and in India, we actually had a team of researchers collecting data every single day. Um, and 2020 is the year where we're going to use both the data and the documentary to push for policy change. That is fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. And Jahawi, you know, we've been friends for a while, and whenever we've had this conversation about the films that you make, what I'm always struck by is the fact that the films that you make are with the people and also for the people. So why do you think this process of making films accessible is important? Well, it, it really comes down to the audience you want to engage. So we're trying to get people to connect with their ocean. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's one thing to parachute in and film and go and then come back with a polished film, but really it's their story 
Mm -hmm. We're there to listen, to understand how they view their environment. And whether it's working on educational films, it's about including the communities you're working in to be part of the f process. And what that does is it creates a feeling of ownership mm -hmm. of this film. Yeah. And people get truly excited about it. I mean, we've been working with fishermen who've never seen underwater. And all of a sudden, they see these clips that we show them. They are so excited. And we've had now that they'll come back and they've filmed something on their phone and they send us these little clips and they're like, what's this? You know? What have you seen? And through this, we got the first ever footage of Risso dolphins confirmed in Kenya's waters from a fisherman of Lamu. That's amazing. So we're making incredible discoveries. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, now when we're going into community engagement and through some of the films I've done before, we have the actual community in the Lamu archipelago has come together because they want to set up a community marine protected area off Lamu. Because wow. they see the benefit of the ocean now and they've fallen in love with it. So we're actually seeing communities really taking the step. Mm -hmm. And that is, I mean, that creates such hope within me. I mean, I think it's fantastic. That's incredible and I'm so proud of you. <laughs> now, do you have hope? Yes, I do. So I've been around for 22 years and I feel like <laughs> in the last 22 years alone, so much has changed with our oceans and not for the better, to be honest. But at the same time, we've seen so much amazing stuff happening with researchers and scientists and students. There's been a groundswell of support for marine protection in the last two decades. So I am hopeful, but the one thing that I would say is that Hope on its own is cute, but hope when married with impact is the dream team. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>